Uh, so, uh, Jay, let's uh, move on to you. Um, uh, you know, Streak again is doing uh, um, fantastic work in the uh, uh, the markets. So, I want to just uh, you know switch over now uh, to another topic uh, in the fintech space, which is uh, uh, again quite common. We have seen uh, uh, AWS. We have actually seen a three x spurt in malicious activity uh, over the past year, right? Especially um, since the pandemic and you know, a lot of people working from home and all that has caused uh, uh, a lot of security uh, security issues uh, with the companies and people have, uh, have been forced to kind of look at their security posture and uh, you know uh, look at taking measures over there. Uh, so I just want to understand, uh, you know, some of the best practices we're employing around uh, protection of user data, complying with various privacy laws, safeguarding yourself against, uh, you know, online attacks like phishing, hacking, um, you know, especially when employees are working from home, they might not have the most secure environment, they might be connected to Wi-Fi that's not your standard corporate Wi-Fi. Right. You also have a lot of user data, you also have a lot of, you know, uh, actual user information so how are you looking at security and protection of all this uh, sure um so i think i'll just pick off from where you know yash left that in startups in india specifically security has taken a back seat and the reason is that most companies most founders think that security comes at a cost you know it's all about cost optimization and when they look at cost cutting the first thing they look at is security and you know they always think that uh, you know let the company grow a little bit more and then maybe you'll come back and look at it so I just want to give you know um, a few takeaways, a few tips of how startups need not really spend a lot of money, but can take a, another different approach, which will ensure there's enough security and at least in places where it's absolutely required, right? So I think it starts uh, by first educating everybody in your company about security. So it shouldn't be confined to a specific team that would uh, basically look at security uh, in specific and only that particular team is aware about all the best practices, et cetera. So specifically the tech team, all parts of the tech team, whether it's DevOps, the developers, or maybe the front end team, all of them should be very well educated about these security practices. So, and we should be writing secure code in terms of mitigating risks in the first place. So when I talk about the developing team, if they're already aware about uh, cross-site scripting and SQL injections and all the different hacks, they would take preventive measures about writing their code itself in a more secure way that would mitigate these security vulnerabilities. And then when it moves on to the quality and testing team, they should also scan for security vulnerabilities from their end and make sure that the code that has been written not only satisfies customer requirements, but is also looking at security best practices. And then when it finally moves to the DevOps team, and that's where you know the pressure really is. So uh, that's the it's the DevOps team. They take the hit when something goes wrong. Everybody's looking at the DevOps team. When everything is fine, nobody even remembers them, right? That isn't how it's supposed to be. And uh, I think their automation can really help a lot. Uh, most of DevOps should be automated, and the DevOps team should be more of, more or less supervising or building great infrastructure that really doesn't need human intervention. And there, by default, by reducing human, uh, it will reduce error because you don't have so much human interference and you'd rather spend your time writing really great code that will automate things and ensure that your code is doing all the security vulnerability scans. So you can integrate that in an automated way with your CI CD processes. So I think that's how we should go about it. Once you've done all of this and, uh, you know, of course, there are a lot of even third party uh, vendors out there nowadays that give you protection <laughs> and DDoS attacks, bot attacks and, you know, firewalls and it's great to have all of them up. But once you set up this entire great defense system for your web applications, uh, and I'm saying web applications because most software companies, sorry, most fintech companies these days, most startups are all web app uh, based companies and this applies to them. So when you're looking at it, the next thing you should do is do these penetration tests yourself. Okay. So, you know, uh, maybe it's good if you can afford it, hire an external company that will do these penetration tests for you. And you can have like a red team versus blue team kind of a thing where you have the external organization doing uh, penetration attacks on, on you. And then there's a blue team sitting in your company defending those attacks. It's great to have that system. If you can't do that, you can still do it yourself and do mock tests and make sure that whatever system you've built is really effective. And then coming to the front end, so most of the time the pressure is on the back end and front end gets left out, uh, thinking that, you know, there's not, a, there's not a lot of threat coming from the front end. But um, let me give a small example of cookies. 
So most startups these days use cookies a lot because it's very efficient and easy way of coding and they rely heavily on, on, on browser cookies. So if you are using cookies, uh, I think you should remember these three fundamental rules, which is number one, don't excessively use cookies, only use them if it's absolutely necessary, don't rely heavily on them. And even if you do use it, uh, do not store sensitive or critical information, user information in these cookies. That's very, very crucial. Point number two is have an expiry date for all your cookies, right? So use it for a limited time only and then make sure it has an expiration attached to it. And third of all, it needs to be encrypted. If you do need to save something in cookies, make sure that all the data is encrypted. So things like this would, you know, really, really help. You go a long way and you don't need to really push back on security and, you know, look at it when you're, when it's too big to kind of rebuild things and it'll cost you a lot more at that point. Great points, Jay. Great points. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's it's probably useful for everybody at uh, different levels to kind of look at. And and you were bang on when you said uh, in most of the cases we are also looking at um, uh, you know, security issues. It's startups that started with you know two people, ten people, and at that point security wasn't a problem. Everybody had access to their consoles, and everybody was you know like happy. And then suddenly they grow overnight. They forget to kind of go and. Uh, you know, uh, fix those things, and then uh, they, they reach a point and it becomes too late. Yeah, uh, and it's but uh, credibility also as a company, and that's the biggest I, price you pay. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, uh, so uh, there is a question from the audience uh, that I would just want to kind of uh, put into uh, you know, anybody from the panelists who want to kind of pick it up. Uh, so how do you classify all the data in, uh, you know, like all the data that you guys have? Uh, how do you classify them between public, private, confidential, and data that can be shared to team members? Uh, so you have team members who are also, like you mentioned, DevOps and others who probably have access to your servers and all that. How do you kind of look at safeguarding those things? Uh, so we basically built all of our CRMs internally. So that's another great point that you don't rely heavily on third party vendors when it comes to data. That's a huge mistake most companies do. And sometimes it's to cut costs. You go with companies that you have never heard of just because they're, they're, for, they're offering you analytics that are very less cost compared to bigger companies. And sometimes it's just because you're so obsessed with data that you're willing to sacrifice anything, even you know at the cost of your own client's privacy. Uh, I think that is a big no. You shouldn't be doing that. And we as a company build most or all of our uh, uh, systems internally, all our CRMs are internal, and we also do a lot of access management that only it's on an as on need basis that different teams have uh, access to different data. And then uh, there is no overlapping when it comes to teams like that. So we do good access management. One topic that everybody probably here, anybody who's listening is uh, looking at is hiring and team building. Um, and Everybody from the uh, from uh, uh, even people in uh, our organization right now, everybody's wondering about remote work and uh, this whole uh, thing. We all work from home, and now we don't want to go back to offices. Um, Jaya, you you said to me that um, your entire team works remotely today. So uh, I'm going to continue uh, next year. What, what, do, what do you see the trends? <laughs> You're putting me on the spot here because <laughs> <laughs> so I can't comment on a specific time. As you tell when we'll be working from home, but what I can say is we actually found that we've become more efficient working from home than we were before. And right. uh, that is an outcome that we did not expect. So initially, you know, like other companies, uh, we did face a bit of a challenge, but the challenge was just more in terms of communication. So uh, even before the pandemic, so we always had this culture where uh, we all communicate a lot. Uh, and we have like cross team communications and it's probably a little bit more than, you know, other companies. And that's what's always worked uh, like really well for us because we don't believe in a lot of hierarchy. It's fairly a flat structure where every team uh, interacts with every other team. So you would find on a typical day, like, uh, you know, the UI UX designer is sitting with the customer support team uh, where he's explaining about some user problem that arrived out of uh, that a customer face. And he's like getting ideas on how to design like next how to solve this problem. And then you would find uh, the marketing team sitting and talking to the backend developer saying, you know, I want a better CRM system. 
So we have a lot of like cross uh, team communications happening all the time. But we did have an advantage in terms of uh, this uh, before the pandemic that, okay, we have great communication going between teams. And, you know, we also had a lot of the processes that were, we're all very tech savvy people, like all of us, like the design team, the marketing team, customer support team. So we have the same level of, uh, you know, uh, understanding, et cetera, et cetera. And we all work online. We've always been working. Uh, most, almost everything we do has been, you know, like online. So that way things were easier for us. But then what was difficult is, so we just are in this week launching our the next version of Streak, the version four uh, Streak on streak.tech. And we had to build, we had to revamp the entire UI UX uh, during this last one year. And it all happened remotely, right? So it's, it's wow. a little crazy, like how do you communicate? Like, so I have a specific vision for the product. How do I translate this vision to the UI UX designer saying, this is what I want. So it's easier when he's in front of me and I can draw things out and he's drawing on the same board. Uh, so we had to adapt to all the online tools, et cetera, et cetera. And we kind of, the first month was difficult, but then it was all just smooth. Uh, but I think the most of the credit uh, for all of this goes to our hiring process. Uh, it's because it's easier said than done. Like, how did we achieve this? Like, where does the credit lie? Like, how did we end up with such a great team? Like, why is it all working? Uh, we had right. to switch to online communication. So it really, you know, comes down to our hiring process. And that is where we do things a little bit differently. So in most companies, uh, what happens is initially you have, you know, you go through resumes and then there are multiple technical rounds and then HR round is pushed to the very last. And at that point of time, you've almost made up your mind whether you want to go with this person or not, because it's so technically sound, like you wouldn't want to let go just because you got a random like HR questions wrong, right? But I think that is like a big, big mistake. And that's where things don't really work out because that should be prioritized first. So in our company, what we do is we go through the entire HR round as the first round. And it's not a bunch of random questions that we ask people that's, you know, found in a standard template. It's very, very customized. So we actually spend a lot of time getting to know the person uh, that we are going to hire like and the questions are very specific to the individual itself uh really getting to know what inspires them what takes them what do they want to uh spend time on working in the future what is their career path looking like does their uh visions and goals align with our company itself so this is a kind of process that we take and after that of course there are rigorous technical rounds but and there's a hr round at the end but our initial filtering happens based basis on this because we prioritize it first and uh, at least one of the founders would have spoken to the person who ever joined Streak at least once. And what I personally look for is like two things that he's passionate about. Number one, uh, is he or she passionate about what they're going to be working on? So if I'm hiring, say, a front-end engineer, I want to make sure that this person is really excited about front-end engineering, that, you know, he wants to scrap bootstrap today and then maybe experiment with Vue.js today and then React.js the other day. It need not be just web-based, it could be app-based, but in the front-end domain, he wants to just go in depth and explore things out. And the same thing, even if I'm looking for a designer, now I want to know whether he's you know, passionate about UI UX designing or motion graphics designing. <clears throat> I wouldn't really hire a motion graphic designing a person, even if he's great at it, if his heart lies in you know, UI UX. So I make sure that that aligns. And secondly, I also want this person to be passionate about the industry, the domain that, you know, they're going to be working on. So stock markets is not as exciting as fashion e-commerce. Okay, so yeah. if, if the same UI UX designer who was, say, doing UI UX for a fashion e-commerce company, and he's great at his job, but now he suddenly has to switch to, you know, strategic trading on a daily basis and design like a back testing platform. And then uh, constantly think about, okay, new technical indicators. How do I make this technical indicator simplified? And how do I help a customer deploy the strategy online? It's a completely, I mean, it's, it's a game changer, right? So you have to be also passionate about the space. You need to fit into it. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's not good enough if you're just good at your technical skills, but does your domain also align with it? So all of us in Streak are passionate about the stock markets as well. And that's very, very important. So if these two things are a checkbox, then, you know, you're, you're just welcome to the team because we know you'll figure everything else out. You can learn skills, but you can't learn passion. It just has to lie within you. And I think that's what really worked for us. Yeah, and it shows in the product. I mean, she has such an awesome UX. I've been following it from version one. Um, Thank you. Jaya, uh, any uh, final thoughts on um, 
uh, how do you, how do you constantly up your game and differentiate yourself in the competition i think you made a great point about hiring the right people uh, and uh, right. using that but then there is the fintech space just has so many startups how do you kind of you know, work on differentiating yourself right i think uh, <clears throat> i think yash made a really good point so listen to your customers right so that is where it all really starts they're already telling you what to do uh, unlike don't listen to your competitors don't look at your competitors platform i mean look at it to see what they're doing but don't copy them don't imitate yeah. them that's not going to get you anywhere your customers are the ones who are telling you what to do next you know your what your competitors are already doing it it's too late it's been it's it's already done uh, what should you be doing next always comes from your customers right so listen to them they know what they want just give it to them in the way that you're supposed to and i think shannon also said it uh, really well when you know measure it so once you've actually innovated something and put it out there don't take it for granted keep measuring it build on it uh, you'll know whether it's it's the right solution or not if it's not don't be scared to kind of reiterate and then put something else out there and more importantly stick to your core values uh, because ultimately that's what uh, should reflect in your product and as long as you're sticking to your core values and you're imbibing them into your product you will always you know stay on top of the trend